Hello, church family. This is Pastor Zach. Uh, good to see you, even though I can't see you, but you can see me. Um, really miss being with everyone and seeing you and hearing you. Appreciate the interaction correspondence that many of you have given to us. We're praying for you. Just kind of want to give you a quick update on our services because of everything going on uh, in our world and the things with the virus that is out there. We won't be having any services until there are further updates given, but as soon as uh, we feel that it's safe through the different agencies and the government, things of that nature, then we certainly will let you know of that. I hope it's soon, uh, but we want to be wise in our decision-making. Until then, you will be able to access each week a sermon online. Um, it'll be on our website in the same place as all of the sermons always are. You simply go in to our website, clintonbiblefellowship.org, and you just will find the Listen tab. You can click on that, you access the link that is there, and you can worship and study the Word of God here each and every week uh, as we continue on our study in God's Word. So it's been a while since we've been together, and we are going to be in John chapter 12 this morning. Now, we're only going to look at three verses. John chapter 12, verses 9 to 11 it's been a while since we've been together. It's been a while since we've been in the Gospel of John. So I want to give you kind of a quick review, uh, a reminder of the things that we did look at leading up to this. Let's read in John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Verse 1, it says, Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. This makes me stop and pause. We talked about this. What kind of aroma are we giving off to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? What is our house filled with? What is God's house filled with? What is our minds and our hearts filled with? What does that aroma smell like in our daily lives that we are giving off to Jesus Christ? Verse 4, But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? In other words, about one year's wages at that time. Verse 6, This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box. And he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come before you. I thank you for the power of your word. It doesn't matter when it's given or where it's given or the means that are used to uh, relay that message. You have said your word will not return void. And so we trust in that. We place our trust in you and in your word. And I pray that the same power of your holy word would even come through this recording and come into the midst of the homes and the hearts and the minds of all those who are watching it. God, I pray that you would use this time to edify your church, be with our nation, be with your people, be with your church bodies. God, that you would keep us closely knit together, that you would be honored, that you would be exalted, that we would turn to your word in everything and all that we say and do. Be with this time now as we open up your word, and may it be used to edify your church, to edify your people, and to bring you glory. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray it. Amen. So we see a few things as we review verses 1 through 8 out of John chapter 12. This is the second time that we have in two consecutive chapters that Jesus went back to Bethany. Remember the first time that he went in John chapter 11, he went for the dead. That was Lazarus. But this time... He's coming back for the living. And we touched on that. He came back the first time for Lazarus, and the second time he came back for the living to look after his children. We see that you have Martha, who was there, who was still serving. You had Mary, who was still worshiping. And you had Lazarus, who was still living. I love that in verse number one. It says, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, past tense. He is still alive. Uh, he was alive in this context, and that is the life that Jesus gives to each and every one of us. There is no taking that back when it comes to the eternal spiritual life that Jesus gives to us. Listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. 
As he spoke here to the Pharisee Nicodemus, who was a ruler of the Jews, John chapter 3 and verse 14, Jesus says, And as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And then in John chapter 5 and verse 24, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him, who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death unto life. So we see and are reminded once again that the life that Jesus gives in us spiritually when we profess him as Lord, when we believe in him, when we follow after him with our heart, that life is permanent, and that never changes. And so Jesus had called Lazarus back out of the grave. Very interesting to note, we know in Hebrews we're appointed to die once. So this had already happened to Lazarus. We don't have in Scripture as to when or how Lazarus was taken to heaven, um, but many believe, and, and I am in that camp as well, that when Jesus rose from the dead three days later, that was when, as he resurrected 40 days after his own resurrection, as he was ascended in the heaven, that was when Lazarus went with him. But to be sure, he didn't see death, physical death, that second time. So Jesus went back to Bethany to look after his children was the first reason. The second reason was to protect and rebuke his own. Look again in verses 7 and 8. Jesus said in response to Judas when he was uh, condemning them about the money box that had been broken open there, or excuse me, the, the, the oil box that had been break, broken open there and anointed Jesus' feet, he was worried about the money. But Jesus said in verse 7, Let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Remember, as we talked about this the first time, very short uh, to put this in context, she gave Jesus her very best. She didn't wait until he was dead and gone. She gave everything she had right then. And are we doing that? Are we giving Jesus our very best right now? Are we reserving it or holding on to it? Or we don't want to be put out. We don't want to come out of our comfort zone. But what are we giving Jesus today? And now we come to verses 9 through 11. And this is where we'll be anchoring today. Look at verse Nine. Now, a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, that is Lazarus, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. Now, remember, let's go back just for a moment. This is the purpose that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead to begin with. We see this in John chapter 11, verses 42 and 45. As Jesus came to the tomb of, Jesus, of Lazarus, look at what he prayed. John 11, verse 42, he says, And I know that you always hear me. He's praying to his heavenly Father. Because, but because of the people who were standing by, remember who the people were that were standing by, by, Mary, Martha, his disciples, the skeptics, the doubters, because of the people who were standing by said this, that they may believe that you sent me. That is the purpose of the miracle. Look at verse number 45 in John 11. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. This is the purpose of Jesus' miracles, and this is the purpose of Jesus' miracle of his eternal life and his spirit living in each and every one of us, is to draw other people to himself. Yes, it's for our own sake. Yes, it's for our eternal salvation, but it's so that we can be used as a, a tool, as a weapon for God's glory to draw other people to Jesus Christ. So in verse number 9, we see, and we are going to follow through in these three verses, the reactions to Lazarus. That is the reactions to the miraculous. And again in verse number 9, look at it with me. A great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. See, in other words, many wanted to see evidence of the miraculous. They wanted to see evidence of this change. They wanted to see that which was dead and is now alive. They were drawn to this. And the reality is this, is that when we give genuine evidence of the difference of Jesus Christ in us, 
when we give evidence of what we once were being dead spiritually speaking and now we are alive in jesus christ when we give genuine evidence of that when our witness and our testimony is valid we too will draw other people to our to to us but for jesus christ we will draw others other people will want to come to us to see the difference that jesus makes are we doing that are people drawn to us do they see a difference in us and of course the question here is how do we give genuine evidence of the difference that jesus makes how do we draw other people to us the first is by crucifying our flesh we will never be drawn to uh, christ we will never draw other people to christ if we keep living like we did in the past before salvation listen to what paul says in galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In the same book of Galatians, chapter 5 and verse 24, Paul says, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. One of the biggest obstacles that Christians faced in drawing others to Jesus Christ is our own testimony or our lack thereof. In other words, we still look like, act like, talk like, live like, conduct ourselves like the rest of the world. We, we haven't crucified our flesh. And again, in the book of Galatians chapter 5 and verses 19 through 22, when it gives the evidence or the fruit of the flesh is what Paul is writing there to the church in Galatia. Using that as a template, and in context of our study here, that one of the reasons that we don't draw people to Jesus Christ is because we haven't crucified our flesh, then that means we haven't truly crucified our adulterous, fornicating, unclean, lewd, idolatrous, wicked, hateful, contentious, jealous, angry, selfish, quarrelsome, opinionated, heretical, envious, murderous, drunken, revelous, boisterous nature. No wonder people aren't being drawn to Jesus through those that call themselves Christians. If that's true, and if we don't crucify our flesh, if we don't crucify our sin nature, that is all that they're seeing as we take the evidence of the things in Galatians 5, 19 through 22 about the fruits of the flesh. And we break those things down, those words, and we see the original Greek in the depths of what we just gave here this morning second way that we give genuine evidence of the difference that jesus makes and draw people to us is by communicating our faith folks if we remain silent nobody hears what our savior has done matthew chapter 5 and verse 16 jesus tells us to let our light shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our father in heaven in second corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3 if our gospel is veiled or hidden that means, do I dare do this? If, if, if we do this with our gospel, nobody is going to hear or see or know what Jesus Christ has done in us and through us. The greatest way that we communicate our faith is through the life that we live. But unfortunately, many times our silence is caused by our own self-acknowledgement of hypocrisy. In other words, the faith that comes off of our lips, we know is not the same faith we have in our heart. The faith that we claim that we have is not given evidence in the fruit that we bear in the lives that we live. And the most opportune time that we have to communicate our faith, the most opportune time uh, to let people know about the difference that Jesus makes in us is when it's most difficult for us to live the life of Christ. In other words, the most opportune time to let people see and know the difference that Jesus makes in us and can make in their lives is in the most difficult of circumstances. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. You're more than welcome to go with me. I encourage you to do that. You have the ability now of something you don't do on a normal Sunday morning. That is, you can push the pause button. You can catch up to the scriptures that I'm reading. Uh, but in Second Corinthians 4, and verses 7 through 11, Paul says this, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard-pressed, on every side yet not crushed we are perplexed but not in despair 
persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Let me pause just for a moment. Right now, the pandemic of the coronavirus has taken over our world. And the concerns that exist there because of it, the health issues, the impact financially and in our economy, um, the questions of the unknown, how much more severe is it going to get? How many lives may be lost? Are we at risk? And it, the world is just spiraling into chaos. I, I want to pause here real quick. We all have said, I have said at times, that this world is out of control. And the reality that God has given me here recently is that this world is not out of control. It's spiraling into chaos, but God is always in control. Take affirmation of that. Take comfort in that. And know that the power of our God still reigns today. He is in control of everything, no matter how it may appear. But in our context this morning, we have the greatest opportunity, one of the most unique opportunities perhaps this generation will ever see to show a chaotic world what the peace of Jesus Christ truly looks like in the face of adversity. Listen to what Isaiah chapter 8 and verses 18 says. Here I am and the children whom the Lord has given me. We are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. We are to be examples to the world. Romans 8, 36, which is also recorded in Psalms 44, 22, says, For your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Let me just encourage all, each and every one of us. Look at these opportunities as to what God wants to do in us and through us. Let this serve as an opportunity to show the lost world the difference that the peace of Jesus Christ makes in us. Anybody can live a life of peace when things are the way they're supposed to be. But does that peace emanate from us and consume and control us and everything we say and do when we're under attack or when things aren't going the way we want them to go or when tragedy strikes or when we're quarantined or whatever this world, this life may bring our way? Do people see and know the peace, the difference that Jesus Christ makes in us? And the third way that we see and can give evidence of the peace that Jesus makes and the difference that Jesus makes and draw other people's people to us and to him is by committing to righteousness. It's not our standards that we live by, but the holy standard of God. Isaiah 53, 6 says that goes completely contrary to who we are. It says that all we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned each one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In Matthew 6, 33, Jesus says um, to uh, seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Listen to Romans chapter 6 and verse 13 says, Paul says, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead as your, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. In James chapter 1 and verse 20, it says that the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. In John, James chapter 3 and verse 18, it says, Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And in 1 Peter 1, 16, God tells us that we are to be holy because he is holy. Folks, it's not our standards we're supposed to live by. And many times, one of the reasons that people are shunned and driven away from the church of Christ, from the body of Christ, from the name of Christ, from the word of Christ, is because they look at us and they see us being committed to our opinions, our righteousness, our convictions, but not God's. And often we as Christians deceive ourselves into truly believing that our sinful actions are biblical because it's our own thoughts, our own emotions, our own opinions, 
that are actually sovereign in our lives and not God himself and not his standards. In other words, God's word isn't paramount in our lives. And we disguise that fact with our own improper interpretations of God's word, and we convicts, which convicts us of those sinful patterns, and we simply ignore them altogether. So we have to commit to God's righteousness, to God's standards, if people are going to see the difference that Jesus makes. Now look at verses 10 through 11. It says, But the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. Now, we've touched on the uh, ramifications socially and within the, the theological realm, if you will, there as to why they were jealous of Jesus. But this runs deeper. This runs deeper here. So why in the world would they want to put Lazarus to death? Why would they want to kill a man who had been raised from the dead? There are three main reasons, I believe, as to why they wanted to kill Lazarus. One is arrogance. They thought they could undo what Jesus did. We've already touched on, we're all uh, appointed to die once. There is no way uh, they were going to kill Lazarus again. There was certainly no way, as there is no way with us, that anybody... Uh, can take our life eternally. Because as Christians and followers of Jesus Christ, no coronavirus, no terrorist, no violence, no act of hatred, no anger, nothing can remove us from our eternal gift of salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are sealed and bound through the power of God. And nobody can take that from us. So we may die, physically from various things. It could be viruses, it could be tragedy, it could be anything. And, and if God doesn't return, that, that is a reality. We're going to leave this earth. But we are sealed forever, eternally, if we profess Jesus Christ as Lord. So they weren't going to kill Lazarus spiritually. I believe God had a special hedge about him. They weren't going to touch him physically either. But they thought they could undo what Jesus did. In Psalms 115 and verse 3, it says, Our God is in heaven, and he does whatever he pleases. In Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 13 and chapter 46 and 9 through 10, it also talks about that God fulfills and accomplishes and does all his pleasure. He is the God of eternity. He always has been and always will be. Nobody has stopped him before. They're not going to stop him today. They're not going to stop him tomorrow. His purposes are always going to be fulfilled. There is absolutely nothing that man or principalities or powers or darkness or evil or virus or anything else can do to undo or thwart the purposes of God. Romans 8.28 says, All things work together for good to those who love him. All things. But many people, both believers and non-believers alike, try to stop the power and work of God in their lives. Here are three ways you may be saying, how, how do we do that? How do we try to thwart the work of God, the power of God? One, we deflect and reject God's truth, correction and conviction, especially when it runs contrary against the grain of our own personal opinions and how we see things, our lifestyles, decisions, and choices. Two, we accept God's love, his grace, and his mercy as biblical, but we reject his correction and conviction and discipline, many times deeming them too harsh. We look for a secondary interpretation. Or three, we pray against the will of God, both knowingly and unwittingly, passing our desires off for the will of God, and then trying to convince God of the same thing then trying to convince ourselves and other people that what we want is actually God's will. And many times, if we're honest and uh, realistic with ourselves and with other people, many times a lot of the decisions that we make and the things that we do, we haven't even consulted God in prayer. I tell you, that, that is a dangerous ground to be on, to claim something as the work or the will of God, and we haven't even prayed about it. But these are just three examples of how we try to undo what God wants to do or how we try to reject what God wants to do. 
The second reason as to why these individuals wanted to kill Lazarus after he had been raised from the dead is pride. They weren't going to accept anything Jesus did or said, regardless of what Jesus did or said. Look at verse 37 of John 12 with me. It says, But although he, Jesus, had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. Look at everything just in the Gospel of John, and you can kind of do a chronological study of the different things that Jesus had done throughout the Gospels, and they, they still didn't believe in him. The, the fact that this man was sitting there having a meal with him who had been dead for four days wasn't enough. This is exactly what Jesus spoke about in Luke chapter 16, verse 31. Remember when Lazarus, another Lazarus, the rich man had died and the beggar uh, who was outside his gates, he had gone to heaven. The rich man was in the embrace of Abraham and the rich man plum has plummeted into hell. And he was pleading with Abraham to drop water on his tongue, to send people back to his family, to warn them of this horrible place. And this is what Abraham said in verse 31 of Luke 16. Though uh, they, if they don't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't believe anybody, even though one may rise from the dead. There's just no amount of evidence. Some will never accept any amount of evidence for Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. But remember what I've said countless times. Just because somebody refuses to acknowledge the facts does not mean they cease to exist. But understand this, church. This just isn't dealing with unbelievers. There are many Christians who, no matter how much biblical evidence somebody, anybody may give them about a particular topic or a circumstance, it's not going to sway their opinion or change their mind. Their mind is made up about other people, about the circumstances they're in, about their own opinions, about their own actions, even if it means blatantly ignoring God's truth in their own conscience. So pride. Pride is the second reason as to why they wanted to kill Lazarus, and many times we want to kill the truth of God in our own life. The third reason as to why they wanted to kill Lazarus is truth. The miracle clearly supported what Jesus proclaimed. It'd be one thing that he was claiming to be the Son of God, and uh, he came there and prayed, and it was just one great big sham. But there was evidence and fruit over and over and over again that Jesus was who he claimed to be, and this really was a culmination of that within the Gospel of John prior to his own resurrection. And so here they are. If they're not going to accept the evidence, what do you have to do with it? You've got to get rid of it. Go back with me to John chapter 8 real quick. Turn your Bibles to John 8. John chapter 8. Let's, let's review this again. What do you do with evidence or truth if you don't want to accept it or agree with it? You've got to get rid of it. In verse 37 of John 8, Jesus says, I know that you are Abraham's descendants. Now remember, contextually, there were murder plots. There were all kinds of things that they were plotting about Jesus behind the scenes, if you will. Uh, they were tired of him. They didn't want to hear his message anymore. Um, they thought he was blasphemous. They thought he was heretical, and so they wanted to get rid of him. And look at what Jesus says in verse 37. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me. Why? Because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. In other words, you wouldn't be doing the things that you're doing. Look there in verse 40, but now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We touched on what they were insinuating with Jesus. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. In the Greek, remember when we first studied this, that phrase of or that sentence you're not able to listen to means you're not willing to accept my word. Verse 44, you are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. 
He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Notice there, I find it very interesting that Jesus points out that Satan doesn't stand in the truth. But make no mistake, you can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and throughout Scripture, specifically when Satan tempted Jesus. Satan doesn't stand in the truth, but he dabbles in the truth. Satan doesn't stand in the truth, but he distorts the truth. These are the works that we can identify in the world today. When we want to know if truth really is truth, are people standing in truth or are they dabbling in truth? Are people convicted and living by truth or are they distorting and perverting the truth of God's word? And this is what Peter says in the end time, 2 Peter chapter 3, that untaught and unstable people will twist the interpretation of God's word to their own destruction. And so we have to be aware of these things. So Satan doesn't stand in the truth. Why? Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Look at verse 45. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. So back to John chapter 12 and verses 9 through 11. The final reason as to why these individuals wanted to kill Lazarus was because he was evidence of the truth that Jesus was who he claimed to be, living, breathing in the flesh, evidence that he was indeed the Son of God. They had power to forgive sin. They had power over the grave. They had power over disease. They had power to feed the multitudes with little. He had this power to make the blind to see. He had the power to make the lame walk again. He has the power to heal. And there are still many people today, both inside and outside of the church, that are not thoroughly convinced of the power of God. Are you convinced of that truth of who God is? One sin leads to another. They rejected the Messiah. Then that led to plotting his death. Now they plan to murder Lazarus. Let me read to you James chapter 1, verses 12, 16, as to the process of sin that God warns us of. James 1 and verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, He will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Why is there this warning at the conclusion of the statement in James? Deception is one of the enemy's greatest weapons. And I have often told you and shared with you that one of the reasons that it is so effective is because those who are being deceived don't realize that they're being deceived. They feel they're right sometimes even feeling that they're biblical. And we too can fall into that trap. That's why we have to look at what God's word says. And then we measure that up against what we think we should do or what we want to do or what we want to say or what we condemn or what we criticize or what we judge. These people in this context weren't willing to do that. And even though they had truth right in front of them in the, the, the uh, flesh of Lazarus, but also Jesus Christ himself, who is truth. And make no mistake, Jesus is truth. Truth is a person. It's not a theory or a concept. Even though they had him right in front of them, they still rejected that. And when we begin to reject that on those small levels, one sin leads to another, and it ultimately produces death. Rejecting or perverting God's truth always leads to deeper sin, darkened minds, and deadly consequences. But here's, here's the, the, the skinny. Just like Jesus, just like Mary, just like Martha, just like Lazarus, if we live the life that God calls us true to, his truth will be our defender and our greatest witness. The life we live will bear evidence of who we really are. There is no doubt Lazarus was alive and was a walking billboard of God's power. 
Jesus himself, the life that he lived, the fruit that he produced. In three and a half years, just in his gospel ministry, three years of walking on this earth in front of people, everybody knew who he was, but not everybody accepted it or believed it. But the fruit of his life is what bore the greatest witness of who he was that culminated in his death, burial, and resurrection. And yet, even at his resurrection, some of his own disciples still didn't believe what they had seen. So what do we do with all this? What do we do with these three verses here this morning? Let me challenge all of us, 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 we, I, you. What do we do with this? Are people going away and believing in Jesus because of what they see in us? Are we giving evidence of the fruit of Jesus Christ in our lives? Do people see the peace of Jesus, the difference of Jesus, the difference of God's power and his presence in us, even in these most difficult times? What about your family? Is your family believing in the peace and the face of God? Do they see that being exuded within the walls of your home? I leave us with three scriptural references and challenges here today. In Acts chapter 4, verses 5 through 13, Peter and John stood before the Sanhedrin, and Peter spoke with boldness and gave the gospel that day. And in verse 13, it says, When they perceived that they were untrained and uneducated men, they realized they had been with Jesus. So the first challenge that I give to us this morning, do people know we've spent time with Jesus? The peace of Jesus, the purpose of Jesus, the power of Jesus is not going to be evident in our lives in any setting, but especially in the midst of chaos, especially in the midst of difficulty if we don't spend time with him ourselves. Number two is from James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, and it talks about the tongue, and it talks about uh, the, the, the tongue of the righteous, the, the tongue of the people of God does not produce both blessing and cursing. It doesn't produce sweet water and bitter waters. Jesus says you will know them by their fruits, just as you know the type of tree. What kind of fruit has a person or a church or people, what have they produced? And what do they say? So the second challenge that I give to us, do people see and hear evidence of us talking like Jesus. Let me just encourage you, it's not just in talking like I'm talking today, but in today's world of social media and all the things that we have, the words that we put out there, the words that we publish, the words that we email, the words that we say, they're there. They're spoken in one capacity or the other. Are they reflecting the genuineness of the evidence of Jesus Christ? And then third, in Luke chapter 6, verses 43 through 45, and I ask you to turn there this morning. That's where we will end. Don't close your Bibles yet. Go to Luke chapter 6, verses 43 through 45, and here's the third challenge that I give to us as far as our people going away and believing in Jesus because of us and what they see in us. Jesus says in Luke 6, verse 43, For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Folks, it's this simple. You can fool man. You can disguise things. You can fool yourself. You can sometimes fool your spouses. You can sometimes fool your pastor. You can sometimes fool your coworkers. You can sometimes fool your church. But whatever it is that you and I have filled our hearts with is what's going to come out eventually. And that gives evidence of what really is inside of us. Jesus was the Son of God, and everything that he did bore witness to that. It gave evidence of everything he said, everything he spoke, everything that he did, including raising Lazarus from the dead. So my question, my challenge to each and every one of us this morning, are we giving evidence of the difference that Jesus makes? 
Are people being drawn to us or are people being pushed away from us? Are people being drawn to Jesus or are people being pushed away from Jesus because of us? Father, I come before you and I thank you for your word. God, I pray that I would give evidence of Jesus. I pray that people would see the fruits of righteousness not because of me, not for me, but because of the power and the might and the strength of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ who abides and lives in me. May we all surrender control of these things to you. May we be challenged by these things here, O God. And Father, I pray for our church. We're apart right now, and it's hard. Let each and every person know how much I miss them. And I am praying for them, and I do love them. Father, I pray that they would be protected and comforted both physically and spiritually and mentally. O God, I pray with you this morning. I pray to you and plead with you through the almighty, holy, shed blood of Jesus Christ. Cover as your people and protect us. And Father, I pray that in the midst of this chaotic season, that we would give evidence of the difference that Jesus makes in us, that they would want to see the difference of the life of Jesus living in each and every one of us. In the precious name of Christ, we pray it. Amen. I love you. I'm praying for you. And I hope to see you soon. God bless.